Did you kill? Uh, and I've been in touch. Out? Did you Hell, kill? no. I wouldn't waste my time killing Rebecca Zahara. I never touched her. And I was in that guest house, and that's all I can tell you. I mean, it's ridiculous. To uh, it's just so insulting that somebody would waste their time killing Rebecca Zahara. This is the true story of Rebecca Zahau, a loving and driven young woman, someone that built an amazing new life for herself against all odds. But then suddenly, in the most mysterious of ways, she suffered a devastating loss before seemingly losing herself. But things here were not as they appeared. What happened to Rebecca? Viewer discretion is advised for this educational documentary. Welcome or welcome back to Dark Case Documentaries. I bring you true crime, disturbing stories and other things that you may later regret knowing with regular uploads every week. Please do join the quickly growing, incredibly supportive Dark Case family by hitting subscribe now and turning on notifications. Remember, choosing to be kind can save a life in many ways. Thank you so much for choosing to be here with me. Our love and respect goes out to all those that knew and loved Rebecca and all those affected by this case. Rebecca Zahau was born on March the 15th, 1979 in Falam, a small town in northwestern Burma. Her father was outnumbered in a household of women. Mary was the oldest and Snorum was the baby of the family. She also had a teenage sister, Zena, amongst other siblings. There was never a quiet moment in the house. It was a happy house and a tight-knit family. They were deeply religious, with the girls raised as Protestants. Everyone believed they were destined for bigger things, things that they felt Burma couldn't offer. The family went to live in Germany and Nepal for some time, but finally they settled in America in the early 2000s, living in New York and California. Here, Rebecca really thrived. Rebecca's middle name was Maui. This translates as beautiful one, something that she really did live up to. And yes, in America she did turn heads, but she could also keep them looking with her personality. Her older sister Mary explained, she could make you laugh even on your worst day, and she would take the clothes off her back if she thought you needed it. She just has this warm personality that just lights up the room. In her late teens, she attended the Cavalry Chapel Bible College in Austria. There, she met Neil Nalepa. Neil was 13 years her senior and was from Scottsdale, Arizona. She fell head over heels in love. In 2002, they got married when Rebecca was just 23 years old. They later moved to Phoenix, where Rebecca worked as a technician at an eye clinic. The couple's marriage experienced some ups and downs, of course, and it lasted for eight years until finally, in 2011, they divorced. Throughout the relationship breakdown, Rebecca went through a period of turmoil. She wasn't perfect and had her own misgivings, but don't we all? In 2009, she was arrested and pleaded guilty to shoplifting. She had stolen a piece of jewellery worth thousands of dollars. Then, while still technically married to Neil, Rebecca started dating a prominent individual. This individual was Jonah Shacknai. Another older man, Jonah was 54 years old at the time. He was the founder, chairman and CEO of the multi-million dollar Medicis Pharmaceutical Corporation. Headquartered in Bridgewater, New Jersey, the company made a fortune manufacturing and selling products that treated acne and facial wrinkles. And when I say he was worth a fortune, I mean a fortune. Joyner was the ninth highest paid CEO in all of Arizona, earning $6.4 million in 2010. That's just what he was paid, so imagine how much else was available to him. And with great money comes great power. 
Rebecca first met him whilst working as a technician and soon they began dating. This eventually led to a serious relationship. This was despite Rebecca's marriage to Nalepa and Jonah's two previous marriages looming over them. His first marriage ended in a three-year custody battle over his two daughters. His second marriage to Dina Romano gave him a son in 2005. His name was Maxfield Aaron, who was nicknamed Max. Max's parents' marriage didn't last long. They divorced before 2011. Rebecca gave up her job at the Valley Eye Clinic in order to spend more time with Jonah and to help take care of his children. She put her entire life on hold to move to Coronado and be part of his life. But it wasn't just an ordinary life. She lived in his literal mansion, the historic Spreckles Mansion in the resort city of Coronado in San Diego, situated on Ocean Boulevard. This mansion was built in 1908 by real estate empire builder John Spreckles. This 10,500 square foot oceanfront building has 27 rooms and a separate guest house. To anyone on the outside, it looked like Rebecca was living a modern life fairy tale. A Burmese migrant living in a mansion with a rich businessman doesn't happen every day. But Rebecca's life wasn't a fairy tale and in reality, not everything was as it seemed. Don't get me wrong, this wasn't the normal straight up horror story that we often see. At least, not yet. At this time, Rebecca's life with Jonah and his children was good, but there were rough patches. In particular, these rough patches normally involved his two teenage daughters from his first marriage. These daughters resented Rebecca. It reached a point where she considered ending the relationship with Jonah, or at the very least putting it on hold. But Rebecca's great consolation was establishing a strong bond with Jonah's youngest child, six-year-old Max. Rebecca treated him as her own. She took him to and from soccer practice. She read him bedtime stories. She played with him and prepared his meals as part of their daily routine. She may not yet have had children of her own, but she felt like she belonged as Max's stepmother. But then, just like that, tragedy struck. On July the 11th, 2011, Jonah was away on business. His children were in good hands with Rebecca, that much he was sure of. Rebecca, Max and Rebecca's younger sister who was visiting from Missouri were all in the home. Rebecca was in the bathroom when she heard a tremendous crash. Shouting for Max and her sister as she ran, she waited for reassuring replies. But they never came. She looked over the banister and was met with a sinister sight. It was Max. His tiny body was face down on the floor with a fallen chandelier next to him. And there was blood. A lot of it. Younger sister Zena called 911. Max was unresponsive and was rushed to the Rady Children's Hospital. This is the largest pediatric hospital in all of California. He had fallen face first over a second floor banister. He suffered serious injuries to his face and spinal cord. He suffered hyperextension of his spinal cord, which stopped his heart and cut off oxygen to his brain. First responders were able to get him breathing, but he was without oxygen for nearly 30 minutes. He suffered irreparable brain damage. And sadly, five days later, his body gave in. The Coronado Police Department, headed by Commander Mike Lawton, investigated the case and on the 26th of July determined the death of Max as accidental. Lawton explained that Max appeared to be running down a hallway at the top of the stairs. There, he pitched over a second floor railing. He tried to grab onto a chandelier, then he hit a banister on a stairway, landing and crashing on the floor. It was simply a tragic accident. Or was it? Max's mother, Dina Romano, a clinical psychologist specialising in child and family relations, believed otherwise. A year after her son passed away, Dina petitioned to reopen the case of Max based on new forensic evidence. She commissioned Dr. Judy Melanek. Melanek is a forensic pathologist at the San Francisco Medical Examiner's Office to review the case. Interestingly, the results of her investigation were contrary to the police findings. Dr. Melanek said that Max was too small to fly over the railing, and that his injuries were not consistent with the cardiac arrest and brain swelling due to 
to his fall. The medical examination suggested that Max may have been assaulted and suffocated before his fall. Dina didn't name a suspect and the police declined to reopen Max's case. They stood firm on their original conclusion, saying this was indeed a simple accident. Back to 2011, while the Shackknife family came to terms with Max's passing, just two days later, an equally tragic incident unfolded, shaking the core of the Zahal family. On the day after Max's accident, July the 12th, Rebecca dropped off her sister Zena at the airport for her flight back to Missouri. Later, she picked up Jonah's younger brother Adam, who had flown in from Memphis, Tennessee. The 48-year-old, a tugboat pilot for a company that operates on the Missouri River, had flown in to be with his brother and nephew once he learned of Max's accident. That evening, the two brothers and Rebecca went to dinner before going their separate ways. Max at this time was still in the ICU and visitors were limited. There was nothing that Rebecca or Adam could do to help. He was in very bad shape and it was essentially a waiting game. His dad headed for the hospital while Rebecca and Adam headed back to the Spreckles mansion. Adam was staying in the guest house within the sprawling property, while Rebecca stayed alone in the mansion. We don't know much about what happened that evening, only that there were reports of loud music coming from the mansion as the night progressed. What we do know is that something went very, very wrong. The next morning at around 6.45am, Adam woke up to an appalling scene on the mansion's courtyard balcony. A body was hanging from the bedroom balcony, a female body. Her hands were bound behind her back, her ankles were tied together with a red rope. She was gagged. A blue, long-sleeved t-shirt was wrapped around her head. The sleeves were double-knotted and stuffed into her mouth. He made a call to 911. Emergency, what are you reporting? Yeah, uh, I, I got a girl hung herself in the guest house of uh, it's on Ocean Boulevard across from the hotel, same place that you came and got the kid yesterday. Okay, sir, what is the address? I'm not sure. Uh, 19, I'm in the back house, it's 1928 something. Uh, I'm not sure. Let me call you back. Okay, sir, is she yeah. still alive? I don't know. Okay. He cut down the rope and freed Rebecca from her ties. He tried to resuscitate her while he waited on the paramedics, but his efforts were fruitless. It was far too late. The emergency responder pronounced Rebecca dead at the scene. Two days after Max's tragic end, Rebecca had met her own. The San Diego Sheriff's Department immediately launched an investigation. What they found was downright puzzling. Inside Rebecca's room, the red rope she used to meet her end was tied to the bed's footboard. The other end led to the balcony. Here, the police found her toe and heel prints. This wasn't out of the ordinary for an incident like this. What was out of the ordinary was the book, Buckland's Complete Book of Witchcraft, found on the bed. The book showed drawings of an unclothed woman with her hands tied behind her back. On the door of the bedroom was a cryptic message written in black paint that said, She saved him. Can you save her? Investigators believed that this was Rebecca's final note. A note that didn't make much sense. Her DNA was found on the knots of the rope and on a kitchen knife that she used to cut the rope. Her hands and the rope had black paint smears on as well. No other DNA nor fingerprints were found. The autopsy results revealed instances of head trauma to Rebecca, which according to San Diego medical examiner Jonathan Lucas and German-American forensic pathologist Werner Spitz were due to hitting the balcony while she was on her way down. To them, the case was cut and dry. The evidence ruled out any early suspicions of foul play. A few months later, on September 2, 2011, the Sheriff's Department formally announced their findings. Rebecca had taken her own life out of remorse for Max's terrible accident just two days before. In supporting their claims, the investigators shared their detailed findings including a demonstration on how Rebecca could have possibly bound herself. The story started when she received a call from Adam late in the night telling her Max was in a critical condition and may not survive. 
Just before 1am on July the 13th, Rebecca began to carry out her plan to end her life. After undressing, she tied one end of the rope to the bed's footboard and fashioned a snare using the other end. She then slipped it over her head, cinched it and tied her ankles together. Next, Rebecca made her way onto the balcony, put her hands behind her back and bound them. The binding was such that she could slip one hand in and out of the binding, while the other side remained secure around the other wrist. When the time came, she put both hands behind her back and into this binding, and finally she leaned forward over the edge and fell nine feet below. Rebecca lost consciousness within 15 seconds and passed about 20 minutes later. Clearly, Rebecca had passed at her own hands. Or had she? Rebecca's family rejected the police's theory. They fought back to prove that it wasn't self-inflicted, but it was indeed a case of homicide. Never for a second did Rebecca's family members, even her first husband Neil, believe that she had taken her own life. Just the day before her passing, Rebecca was talking on the phone with her sister Mary. Mary said that Rebecca didn't show any signs of someone who was depressed. She said she was sad about Max, as to be expected, but she wasn't about to take any drastic actions. Rebecca also had extremely strong religious beliefs and a strong love for her family. Would she really have considered doing this to herself? Rebecca was laid to rest on July the 27th, 2011 in St. Joseph, Missouri. But the Zahal family's quest for justice was just beginning. They publicly questioned the findings of the investigators, whom they believed rushed the probe. They set out to prove that Rebecca was murdered and thus hired investigators. They also retained legal counsel and insisted on reopening the case. And when they did, they raised some valid points. For one, there was the forensic evidence that suggested Rebecca may have been hit on the head. This is something that was downplayed by the medical examiner. A lie detector test was administered to Adam and those results were inconclusive. The police hadn't downloaded information from Adam's cell phone, nor had they retrieved his messages sent to Rebecca on the night that she passed. Upon the Zahal family's request, the second autopsy was then conducted by pathologist Dr. Cyril Wedge. He testified that fractures in Rebecca's throat were caused by manual strangulation and not by hanging. This death wasn't actually cut and dry. Her demise may not have been at her own hands. Other inaccuracies were found with the Sheriff's Department's investigation. This included evidence that Rebecca was intimately violated before her passing. The Zahal family pointed their fingers to just one possible suspect, Adam Shacknai. In February of 2018, Rebecca's kin filed a $10 million wrongful death case. This accused Adam of conspiring with Dina, Max's mother, and her twin sister, Nina, in the killing of Rebecca. Their motive was simple, payback. They held Rebecca responsible for Max's accident while he was under her care. Shortly after Max's accident at 10.48pm, Rebecca had received a text from Nina who wanted to stop by the house and talk about Max's accident. Rebecca didn't reply. When surveillance footage showed that Dina and Nina were with Jonah at the hospital the night that Rebecca died, the sisters were dropped from the case, though Adam remained. The Zahal family's lawyer, Keith Greer, argued that Adam beat Rebecca, his brother's girlfriend, saying that this was all during a confrontation about Max's accident, and then he intimately violated and throttled her. They suggested that Adam then staged Rebecca's death, making it appear as though it was self-inflicted. In retaliation, Adam's defence attorney countered that there was no evidence connecting him to Rebecca. He reiterated that only Rebecca's fingerprints and DNA were found on the knife and the ropes that she used to bind herself. And most importantly, Adam had already been questioned and cleared by homicide investigators in Rebecca's death in 2011. After a month-long civil trial in April 2018, the 12-member jury found Adam guilty in Rebecca's death in a 9-3 vote. They awarded $5.2 million to the Zahal family for loss of love and companionship, and a further $167,000 for financial support that Rebecca could have provided to her family. Because it was a civil trial, a unanimous verdict wasn't needed. 
and Adam wouldn't face any criminal charges and couldn't be sentenced to prison. Despite the guilty verdict here, the San Diego Sheriff's Department in December of 2018 decided it wouldn't change its initial findings in this case. Since civil verdicts are often appealed, in February of 2019, Adam appealed the judgment with his defence arguing procedural errors and juror misconduct. However, prior to the final arguments being presented to the judge, Adam's insurance company and the Zahao family reached a $600,000 settlement. This resulted in the civil case being dismissed, vacating the original $5.2 million judgment. This settlement, however, angered Adam, who said it was done behind his back. He called the judge incompetent for allowing the settlement to be reached without any comments from himself or his attorney. The judge clapped back, saying, That puts to rest the civil case. The jury verdict that came out, finding Adam Shacknai guilty of murdering Rebecca Zahau in a civil court, still stands. But still, the Zahao family wanted more. They vowed not to stop until Adam was behind bars. In August of 2019, they offered a $100,000 reward, looking for anyone who may come forward with a lead about what actually happened on the night of Rebecca's passing. It's now time to step up and get the evidence out there, so we can compel this sheriff as quickly as possible to reopen the investigation, said their lawyer. As Rebecca's sister, Mary, emphatically said, I know that she fought the night that she died. She left plenty of clues and plenty of evidence that was ignored. I refuse to stand down. I have to fight for the injustice that was done to her. What are your thoughts about this case? What do you think happened on that night? Let me know down in the comments. Please do hit like if you appreciate what I'm doing here. Thank you to everyone in the Dark Case crew. You too can become a channel member for just 99 pence. A huge thank you to my patrons. Your support makes a massive difference. You too can support my work and be thanked in every video for just $5 per month. So thank you to Rachel David, Kathy Green, David James, Addy Alexander, Karen Aaron Jones, El Palmieri, James Harrington, Shane Woodward, Faster River, Stacey Crogerus, Summer Chambers, Mona Corona, Cepheid Variable, Anthony Watson, Jason Coward, Guardian Paler, Jeremy Sebrenek, Joy Burton, Dawn Croc, Michelle Mims, Natalie Lundquist, Anita Ford, and Darlene. Be careful out there, and I'll see you soon.